Tonight, long to be home. UK gives asylum to son of Singapore founder over persecution claims. Friends in Kazan. Putin and Xi discuss Ukrainian conflict, strengthening ties amidst global tensions. Escalating conflict. Israeli strike on Beirut suburb flattens residential building to the ground. And reviving nostalgia from Mickey Mouse to Captain America. 100 years of Disney magic to be showcased for the first time in Asia. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are bringing you the key stories across the world for this Wednesday and we begin today in Singapore. The son of modern Singapore's founder has gained asylum in the UK following claims of persecution amid a high-profile family feud. Lee Shane Yang has long alleged he faces oppression back home from the Singapore government that was led for 20 years by his brother Lee Shane Loong. The government, however, denies these claims and says he is free to return. Both men are sons of the revered leader Lee Kuan Yew, who died in 2015. Since then, the brothers have been locked in a years-long dispute over their father's house, which has spiralled into a vicious public family battle. Lee Shane Yang showed some documents, including a letter stating his claim for asylum was successful. The the letter also stated the UK government had given him refugee status for five years as it accepted he had the well-founded fear of persecution and therefore cannot return to the country Singapore. Mr Lee, who lives in London, said his wife had also been granted asylum. A Home Office spokesman said it is long-standing government policy that they do not comment on individual cases. Mr Lee said that everything the Singapore government has said was fully public and must surely had been taken into account when the refugee status was granted and that he sought asylum protection as a last resort, yet remains a Singapore citizen and hopes that someday it will become safe to return home. As a member of what has been seen as Singapore's first family and the former chief of Singapore's largest telecommunications company, Mr Lee was very much a part of the country's establishment until he fell out with his brother. Since then, he has joined an opposition political party and become a vocal critic of the Singapore government, roles which he has every intention of continuing while based in the UK. Elon Musk is in the spotlight again as the race between two of the world's richest men, Musk himself and Mukesh Ambani, is intensifying as they prepare to face off in India's satellite broadband market. After India's government announced last week that satellite spectrum for broadband will be allocated administratively, Rather than through auction, this battle has only heated up. Musk had previously criticized the auction model supported by Ambani. Satellite broadband provides internet access anywhere within the satellite's coverage. This makes it a reliable option for remote or rural areas where traditional services like DSL, which is a connection that uses telephone lines to transmit data, or cable are unavailable. It also helps to bridge the hard-to-reach digital divide. India's telecom regulator has yet to announce spectrum pricing and commercial satellite internet service are still to begin. However, Satellite internet subscribers in India are projected to reach 2 million by 2025, according to credit rating agency ICRA. The market is competitive with around half a dozen key players, led by Mr. Ambani's Reliance Geo. Having invested billions in airwave auctions to dominate the telecom sector, Geo has now partnered with luxembourg based SES Astra, a leading satellite operator. Unlike Mr. Mars Starlink, which uses low-Earth orbit satellites positioned between 160 and 1,000 km from Earth's surface for faster service, SES operates medium Earth orbit satellites at a much higher altitude, offering a most cost effective system. Receivers on the ground receive satellite signals and process it to internet data. Elon Musk Starlink has 6,419 satellites in orbit and 4 million subscribers across 100 countries. He has been aiming to launch services in India since 2021, but regulatory hurdles have caused delays. Many say if his company enters India at this time, it will boost Prime Minister Narendra Modi's efforts to attract foreign investment. It will also help its government's efforts to burnish its image as pro-business, countering claims that its policies favour top Indian businessmen like Mr. Ambani. Chinese President Xi Jinping told Russia's Vladimir Putin that the international situation is chaotic during their BRIC summit meeting in Kazan. However, their strategic partnership is a stabilising force amid significant changes not seen in a century. Russian President Vladimir Putin called Chinese President Xi Jinping his dear friend 
as he praised the relationship between their countries and welcomed Xi to Russia for the opening of the BRICS summit. Russian-Chinese cooperation in international affairs is one of the main stabilizing factors on the world stage. We further intend to enhance coordination on all multilateral platforms in order to ensure global security and a just world order. She told Putin that chaos reigned internationally, but that Beijing's strategic partnership with Moscow was a force for stability amid the most significant changes seen in a century. Over the past decade, Russian-Chinese relations have withstood trials and difficult situations, have come a long way, and have reached an unprecedented level. In May, the two leaders pledged a new era of partnership between the most powerful rivals of the United States, which they cast as an aggressive nation sowing chaos around the world. Meanwhile, Russia is waging war against Ukrainian forces who have received significant help from the U.S. And China is under pressure from a concerted U.S. effort to counter its growing military and economic strength. U.S. President Joe Biden has referred to Xi as a dictator and has said Putin is a killer and even a crazy SOB. Beijing and Moscow have scolded Biden for the comments. A Kremlin spokesperson said Putin and Xi discussed Ukraine, their partnership, and ways to cooperate in the future. The head of NATO warned that the transfer of North Korean troops to fight for Russia in Ukraine would be what he called a significant escalation. A quote, military collusion is what the presidential office called North Korea's deployment of troops to support Russia's invasion of Ukraine while calling for an immediate halt and the retrieval of forces. This came on Tuesday as the National Security Council held a standing committee meeting to discuss potential responses. While the top office opted not to specify what the responses would be as revealing them could impact future cooperation between Russia and North Korea, an official told reporters that responses could be through diplomacy, economic retaliations, or even military action. The official also said weapon supply could be an option. So far, non-lethal weapons have been supplied to Ukraine by South Korea, but the government will reconsider. It will first consider supplying defensive weapons, but if the situation escalates further, it will consider offensive weapons. The top office also called out North Korea for neglecting its own people, calling it a criminal organization. In the meantime, South Korea is the only country to confirm North Korea's deployment of troops for Russia, other than Ukraine, with President Volodymyr Zelensky saying so himself. In addition, the official said that it's not clear how the deployment will impact the front lines in Ukraine as there are many factors that will play into it. And South Korea currently is diplomatically calling for the retrieval of troops before it gets to the front lines and to stop the cooperation at this stage. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, Donald Trump's campaign has filed a Federal Election Commission complaint against the UK's Labour Party accusing it of blatant foreign interference in the US election in aid of Harris Wall's campaign. The complaint cites media reports about contact between Labour and the Harris campaign as well as apparent volunteering efforts, arguing that this amounts to illegal contributions. The Labour Party, however, has not issued an official response. Specifically, the complaint cites newspaper reportings that the Labour-linked individuals have travelled to the US to campaign for Harris. That reporting, the complaint alleges, creates a reasonable inference that the Labour Party has made and the Harris campaign has accepted illegal foreign national contributions. The letter refers to Washington Post reporting that communication were exchanged between the parties and that senior officials have met in private. Additionally, the complaint cites a social media post on LinkedIn which a Labour staff member said that nearly 100 current and former party members will be headed to the battleground states in the US. 
The post from Labour Party Head of Operation Sophia Patel added that 10 spots are available and that they will sort their housing. It appears to have since been deleted. The complaint makes comparisons to an international programme in 2016 in which the Australian Labour Party, or ALP, sent delegates to help with Bernie Sanders' campaign. In that instance, however, the ALP paid for flights and daily stipends. The party and the campaign were each handed down civil penalties of $14,500. Labour activist trips were not organised or funded by the party, it is understood from party officials. Foreign nationals are permitted to serve as campaign volunteers as long as they're not compensated, according to FEC rules. It is considered normal for party officials from the UK to be in contact with counterparts in the US. Meanwhile, a Detroit rapper Eminem stepped into the political arena yesterday in his hometown where he spoke briefly at a rally for Vice President Kamala Harris's presidential campaign before welcoming President Barack Obama to the stage. He said people shouldn't be afraid of retribution or making their opinion known, adding that Harris supports a future for this country where these freedoms and many others will be protected and upheld. The Detroit rapper then introduced Obama who took the stage to the beat of Eminem's Lose Yourself. The former president joked that he noticed my palms are sweaty, a reference to its hit song, before rapping several lines from it. The appearance by Obama and Eminem comes just days before early voting kicks off across Michigan. Democrats hope the star-studded event, which also featured former Lions wide receiver and NFL Hall of Fame Calvin Johnson, will boost enthusiasm among voters. Voter turnout in Detroit, a long-time Democratic stronghold, will be crucially determining who wins the state in November, when Michigan is among a handful of swing states expected to determine who wins the presidency, as well as control of the U.S. Senate. Democrat Elisa Slotkin, who faces Republican Mike Rogers for an open Senate seat, appeared alongside Obama at the rally. Obama attacked Trump as unfit, citing recent incidents such as the town hall where Trump opted to hold an impromptu concert of sorts, swaying back and forth to various songs for about 40 minutes rather than taking questions from voters. Trump has made his own beat for Detroit, appearing with hometown rapper Trick Trick at a rally in the city last week. Trick Trick previously collaborated with Eminem on the track Welcome to Detroit. Updating you on the conflicts in Gaza now, an Israeli airstrike that demolished a residential building in southern Beirut was captured dramatically in several videos. The IDF escalated its aerial assault across Lebanon and claimed the building was a Hezbollah facility. Israeli forces escalating their aerial assault across Lebanon tonight. Taking down this residential building they say was a Hezbollah facility. Dramatic pictures capturing the moment just before that missile made impact. It comes as US Secretary of State Antony Blinken is back in Israel, meeting with top officials, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, for two and a half hours, pushing for peace in the region as the world braces for Israel's retaliatory strike against Iran. For now, the immediate focus for Israel, a new and deadly phase of their war with Hezbollah. A huge explosion lighting up the sky over the Lebanese capital. Israel striking near a hospital. <laughs> Lebanese officials saying more than 60 killed and more than 230 injured in Lebanon in just 24 hours. And tonight, officials confirming a Hezbollah drone hit Netanyahu's house over the weekend. Video circulating online showing the damage near his swimming pool. Netanyahu not home at the time, but calling it an assassination attempt. Amidst the ongoing tensions in the region, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held talks with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to discuss post-war plans for the Gaza Strip. According to the Prime Minister's office, the Israeli leader noted that the killing of Hamas leader Yahya Sinmar will have a positive impact on the return of hostages, the achievement of war goals and post-war plans. Netanyahu thanked the U.S. for its support against the so-called excess of resistance, while Blinken urged the Netanyahu to capitalize on the death of Sinmar and end the conflict in Gaza. The U.S. envoy also called on Israel to improve humanitarian assistance for Gaza. Now, also on Tuesday, the Israeli military confirmed the death of a top Hezbollah leader. Hashim Safidim was reportedly killed in an airstrike earlier this month. Shortly after an Israeli assault killed Hezbollah's longtime leader, Hassan Nasrallah, in September.
E. coli food poisoning linked to McDonald's quarter pounder hamburgers has sickened at least 49 people in 10 states, including one person who died and 10 who were hospitalized. An E. coli outbreak linked to McDonald's in the U.S. has killed one person and sickened dozens. Cases were found across 10 states with most illnesses reported in Colorado and Nebraska. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control on Tuesday said it was linked to one of the fast food chain's most popular menu items, the Quarter Pounder. Investigators have yet to identify the specific ingredient linked to the illness, but they're looking into fresh slivered onions and fresh beef patties. The E. coli strain involved was the same as the one that killed four children in 1993, after they had eaten undercooked hamburgers at Jack in the Box. U.S. food safety attorney Bill Marler, who represented a victim in that outbreak, said onions have been linked to prior cases. McDonald's said in a statement it is temporarily removing the quarter pounder from restaurants in states such as Colorado, Kansas, Utah and Wyoming. Shares of McDonald's plummeted in extended trading. A livestock trader warned U.S. cattle futures could be pressured on Wednesday too. Symptoms for E. coli include severe stomach cramps, diarrhea and vomiting. Most people start feeling sick three to four days after eating or drinking something that contains the bacteria, according to Colorado's public health department. In 2015, burrito chain Chipotle saw its sales battered and reputation hit due to E. coli outbreaks in several states. The former CEO of Abercrombie and & Fitch and his partner have been arrested and charged with running a prostitution and international sex trafficking business. The former CEO of fashion brand Abercrombie and & Fitch, Mike Jeffries, was arrested on Tuesday and criminally charged with sex trafficking and prostitution involving dozens of men. His 61-year-old partner Matthew Smith and James Jacobson, who allegedly recruited men for the couple, were also arrested. Now, 80-year-old Jeffries, who built Abercrombie & Fitch into a popular clothing brand with sexually charged marketing, was charged with one count of sex trafficking and 15 counts of interstate prostitution, involving 15 unnamed victims between 2008 and 2015. The other defendants face the same charges and, if convicted, would serve a mandatory minimum 15-year prison terms with a maximum of life sentences for the sex trafficking charges and 20 years for the interstate prostitution charges. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. King Charles and Queen Camilla departed Australia, officially ending the royal tour after a spectacle on Sydney Harbour yesterday. A classic Australian backdrop, fit for a king. Sydney sparkling and the people bubbling with excitement. The day started with an Aussie tradition. Sangers on a barbie and Charles was put in charge. <laughs> Camilla trading her crown for some tongs. Beneath the southern sun, their majesties got a taste of our sunburnt country. It is no wonder, I think, that Sydney is uh, world famous for its cuisine, whether it's smashed avo, uh, a pav or a cab sav. From our farms. <laughs> to our sporting legends. It was really nice to, to meet His Majesty the King. And everything in between. <laughs> this was a show of Australian multiculturalism at its finest, right in the heart of Western Sydney. The King also making time to meet the Australians of the year. Two doctors working to cure cancer as the monarch wages his own battle. Once in a lifetime experience, I reckon. But the crowning glory came on the glittering water of Sydney Harbour. Thousands flocking to the sails of an icon to see another in the flesh. And finally tonight, Disney Magic has arrived in Asia. The first instalment of its kind in Asia, the Disney 100 exhibition, showcasing 100 years of Disney, has opened its doors in Seoul. 
From Mickey Mouse to Captain America, with more than 250 items on display, pieces of the magical world can all be admired in one location. Big round black ears. Mickey Mouse made his first public appearance in the 1928 animated short film Steamboat Willie and has since become a symbol for Walt Disney. Now, marking a first in Asia, a special exhibition has arrived in Korea, offering a glimpse of Walt Disney's 100 years of magic. The Walt Disney Archives has opened its vault of treasures. From the life of creator Walt Disney to stories of adventures from the world of Disney, including Star Wars and Marvel, are conveyed through various media. There's also a Peter Pan attraction standing more than two meters tall and more than 250 rarely seen artifacts and works of art, costumes and props, and incredible memorabilia for Disney fans to enjoy. What's also special is that costumes from the 2023 Indiana Jones movie, The Dial of Destiny, are being exhibited for the first time in Seoul. The Walt Disney Company says it aims to go back to the basics to carry out Walt Disney's philosophy, and highlighted that the Asia-Pacific region, including South Korea, would be a pivotal platform for the next 100 years. The exhibition is being held at the K Museum of Contemporary Art until December 31st. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Thank you for watching and have a good night.